panel that arrived uh, by shortly at by 1934. Um, the, the issue of uh, s sexuality and sexual function and uh, libido is no longer a theoretical premise. It becomes a material and biological um, fact. You know, that could be argued, but we will we'll address that in discussion. Uh, the next presenter <coughs> today is also one of the people who helped um, form this uh, panel. Jonathan Blenza, Dr. Blenza, uh, is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City. He's a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College and is on the faculty of the New York Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. Uh, I should also say that he's done some incredibly groundbreaking translations. He, he would deny that, but you know, maybe, maybe secretly he believes that. Uh, have to ask him. But uh, uh, translations from uh, many of the original uh, articles and materials from this period that we're discussing. He is extremely knowledgeable and he has a very, very good ground, grounding in psychoanalytic work, obviously, but also knows orthodontomy and knows rights post psychoanalytic work. Exceptionally well. Uh, so here is Dr. Kubel. You might want to put that a little higher. Good morning. I'm going to be talking about a moment in psychoanalytic history uh, at a point where uh, on either side of uh, Freud's publication of The Ego and the Id, there was a transition from a uh, the theory of character based on libido theory and a, an accompanying therapeutic approach based on the topographical theory, uh, from that to uh, what I'll call the structural theory, which everyone calls the structural theory. And um, I'm going to be looking in some granular detail at this. Um, now, of course, this transition was initiated by Freud with this publication, and perhaps even earlier, with the introduction of the uh, idea of the ego ideal. Um, but I, my argument is that in the book Der Triebhaft Charakter, which is usually uh, translated into English as the impulsive character, um, Reich, I think, takes the first steps in introducing structural theory into any clinical um, uh, consideration or problem. So you might ask, why? what's the point? Why, why look at this uh, on a Saturday morning? Well, the point is that, um, good question, right? So the, the reason is that theory uh, tells us what to do in practice. It tells us how to treat patients. And if your theory doesn't tell you how to treat patients, 
it's not a good theory. You should abandon it. And um, so in a contemporary uh, context, we have all sorts of theories of character. And the theories of character tell us how uh, people become ill, uh, and how they stay ill, and how to help them get better. Um, now, it's often said in the literature, well, all animals do the same thing. They're just using different language. And um, I, I don't believe that's true, actually. Uh, but maybe when we get, finally get around to doing empirical studies, we'll find out that it's true, in which case we can throw out a whole bunch of theories. Um, the fact that the field has little in the way of empirical data has pluses and minuses. The good news is that everybody can hold forth and tell you how to treat patients. Um, the bad news is they have no data to support it, or very little data. So the importance of spelling out theories of character and theories of technique is that it's the first step in operationalizing uh, uh, theories that can be then studied empirically. Uh, so, um, so that's the topic. Um, now, when you're talking about Reich, as Dr. Weitzner has um, uh, shown us, that it's immediately problematic because there's a tendency, uh, based on um, what one has heard and read and been told and so forth, uh, simply to reject him uh, is a combination of cliché and caricature that tries to summarize um, what uh, he was about. Um, my aim here is to, in some fine detail, show you what he was about in the psychoanalytic context. I believe that the impulsive character is his most fully realized psychoanalytic work. It's, um, I, I would say, it's sort of uh, uh, the, the apogee of uh, Reich as a psychoanalyst. And from after the appearance of the impulsive character, he more and more goes in his own direction, um, as I think you'll see. Um, so, I just want to bring a little bit of a context to how the problem arose uh, that the impulsive character is trying to answer. Um, okay, uh, to begin with, uh, Reich, Reich was quite young when he got involved with the psychoanalytic movement. He met uh, Reich when he was 22, and almost immediately he was being, I'm sorry, Freud, and um, almost immediately was being referred patients, and um, at the age of 23 he joined the uh, Vienna Psychoanalytic um, Society. And with the opening of the, the Ambulatorium, which was one of the first public psychological <coughs> clinics in the world, he was uh, the first assistant. Now, at the same time he was doing that, he was uh, getting postgraduate training in uh, Julius Wagner Jaurek's uh, public uh, psychiatry and neurology clinic associated with the University of Vienna. Now, the importance of that is that in both contexts, at the uh, outpatient psychoanalytic clinic and at the uh, public university psychiatry clinic, Greg was seeing lots and lots of patients that, um, uh, as Freud himself noted in one of his Congress speeches, analysts weren't seeing. Analysts tended to see wealthy patients who could pay private fees. And these were not wealthy patients who could pay private fees. They had to, by law, they were treated uh, free of charge. So, um, and in fact, the, it's interesting, the Vienna Psychoanalytic had a policy that every analyst that was a member of the society uh, had to devote a certain number of clinical hours to free treatment of patients. So there was a, um, an opportunity for uh, analysts and certainly right to apply the new theories they were learning to a new patient population. And I think that's really key because um, obviously you're, you're going to, um, it's good for theory and, and, and theory development because you're testing on, a, on sort of uh, a larger end. Okay, at, at the, the ambulatorium was also the setting of the, this 
famous seminar for psychoanalytic therapy in which many of the uh, precepts, technical precepts that uh, Dr. Weitzner referred to were uh, developed. Um, I won't go into it much more than that. Okay, uh, now the greater psychoanalytic context. Uh, in the, the decade after World War I, according to Carl Fallon, who's a, a biographer, a historian of uh, Freud and, um, I'm sorry, of Reich, and the, uh, sort of the Vienna scene, uh, he feels that the zenith of psychoanalysis was reached at that time, and there were, uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, cultural influences, the best way to put it. Um, why? Well, um, there were a lot of people, uh, veterans with shell shock and so-called war neuroses, and um, uh, psychoanalysis was a, a modality of treatment that was, uh, that was applied and then helpful to them. Um, Freud himself was uh, in the, the Budapest Con Congress of 1918, um, talked about uh, applying the treatment to the considerable mass of the population. This is when he uh, famously said the, that the pure gold of analysis could be alloyed with the copper of suggestion or even hypnosis. And then there were movies and, and literature. So um, it was a, tech, a time of expansion. Um, at the time that Reich entered the psychoanalytic movement, uh, the, these papers, Freud, of course, was incredibly productive. Um, if you just look at this, it's mind-boggling. All the papers in technique were written in the decade before 1919, when right then of the movement. Uh, the paper on narcissism, all the metapsychological papers, and the introductory lectures. Um, so the, the way that, um, as Strachey, James Strachey, uh, puts it, it was, it was a time of stock taking. So there was sort of a low, um, not really, if you, look, if you look at the publications from Freud, it's, it's remarkable consistency, but there was a brief low, uh, which was uh, soon uh, interrupted by uh, the appearance of group psychology and analysis of the ego in 1921, and of course the ego and the kid in 23. So that's sort of the context. So here is Reich writing the function of the orgasm in 1942. In 1920, there was no hint of character or character neurosis. Quite the contrary. The individual neurotic symptom was explicitly regarded as an alien element in an otherwise healthy psychic organism. It was said that a part of the personality had failed to go along with the total development toward adulthood, thus remaining behind at an earlier stage of sexual development. Fixation. This isolated part came into conflict with the remainder of the ego by which it was held in repression. Now, uh, it's not quite that simple because uh, there was a theory of, um, uh, there was a libidinal theory of character traits that had begun to be uh, developed. But these traits were not viewed as pathological in and of themselves. So uh, the libidinal theory of character traits essentially said that um, a character trait was either, it was basically one of three things. Either it was the continuation of a libidinal striving from infancy, it was a reaction formation to that, uh, or it was a sublimation of that. So, um, in the famous 1908 paper on uh, the anal character, um, these, uh, there was a discussion of the, um, these, uh, the libidinal components that went into uh, the traits of uh, uh, parsimony, uh, obstinacy, uh, and pedantry, uh, or um, um, Right. So orderliness, parsimony, and uh, obstinacy. So 
So there was a theory of character trait, but not of character disorder or abnormal character. Um, so let's look at what the psychoanalytic DSM was in 1920. Um, there were the stasis, stasis neuroses, or actual neuroses, as Dr. Weitzner alluded to. Uh, anxiety neurosis, which was supposed to be caused by um, uh, sexual frustration, like you know, a woman who had a partner who had um, uh, premature ejaculation, for example, in which there was uh, the buildup of sexual excitement that was not uh, gratifying. There was neurasthenia, which tended, or so that it was thought, seen in more in men, and was associated with um, uh, too much masturbation, and, and I suppose an ungratifying type of masturbation. And now those two, uh, anxiety neurosis and neurasthenia, were felt to be uh, vicissitudes of object libido. Hypochondriasis, on the other hand, was felt to be due to a uh, stasis of uh, um, ego libido, um, uh, narcissistic libido. You had the transference of neuroses, conversion and anxiety hysteria, and obsessional neurosis. So-called narcissistic neuroses, perversions, and sexual disorders such as impotence and fragility. Um, the therapy um, was fundamentally um, based on the topographic model, which is that you know the patient would free associate on the couch, and over a period of time, the analyst would get an idea based on what was brought up and how the topic changed and interruptions and so forth. Uh, and then the development of transference in which certain attitudes were directed on the uh, analyst. Uh, that there, were, there was some idea or feeling that was being worded off. And then the analyst guessed, it was an educated guess, but a guess nonetheless, uh, what the unconscious worded off material was. And uh, the patient would um, either accept it or not. And um, there may be a uh, a uh, reduction in symptoms. But um, even at that point, uh, the identification and elimination of resistances uh, had been brought up by Freud in the 1910 Nuremberg con uh, Congress. And um, what's important here is that how is structure sort of accessed in, in practice? How, how does one know that there is um, a particular structure, a character structure? Well, in a treatment, one divines it from resistance. So what we have here is, uh, and what we have here is the beginning of, uh, I think, the structural theory. When, when you're starting to look at resistances and identifying them and interpreting them uh, to a patient rather than simply what is being worded off, the beginning of a structural theory. Um, and, and let me just uh, try to clarify something. The topographic theory, uh, in which there's conscious, pre-conscious, unconscious, that's a structural theory. But it's a, a relatively uh, simple, simple structure compared to the later structural theory of dead ego and supreme. So, in both contexts, you're talking about structure. It's just um, uh, that uh, if in a thoroughgoing uh, topographic approach, you're only going to go to uh, the, the complexes that are being worded off as, as a focus of interpretation. When you start to focus on resistances, um, that's the beginning of a fo focus on structure, in my view. And that gets more and more developed in the ego and the it, and uh, in character analysis. <coughs> and the other thing uh, also is the um, so-called active technique, which most people, I think, associate with uh, Sandor Ferenczi, but it was actually first advocated by Freud himself. And um, 
So those were on the, the uh, table, so to speak, as uh, therapeutic um, uh, measures that can be uh, used, as well as simply interpreting content. Okay, so um, I would argue that modern characterology began with um, Franz Alexander's castration of complex and character, which I think is a wonderful paper. Um, it's really groundbreaking, and let me try to tell you why I think that. Um, he, Alexander <coughs> begins with a reference to Ferenczi's uh, paper, Transitory Symptom Construction During the Analysis. For, Ferenczi had noticed that when he had patients who um, were in analysis and he made a corrective interpretation, they would develop symptoms. In other words, in a way they got worse. Well, how can it be a correct interpretation if they get worse? Some people got conversion symptoms, some people got obsessional phenomena, hallucinations, and so on. Why did they get worse? So, um, the answer is this. Uh, sort of the best example, he had a woman in treatment who had a dream in which the, the meaning of the dream was a, a uh, disappointment that her husband could not furnish her with certain expensive items. So Ferenczi tells her, look, I think you're disappointed in your husband. He's not making enough money. Whereupon she got a very severe toothache. And the interpretation that followed up, the first interpretation was, um, I think what you're telling me is that your tooth aches for you know, such and such a night. Nice watch, right? So that turns out to be a Hungarian, uh, he was Hungarian, a Hungarian um, saying that sort of goes like our saying, uh, my mouth waters for such and such. Then she, she accepted the interpretation. So what happened here is that some unconscious content was sort of bubbling to the surface, and Ferenczi says, you know, you hate your mother, or whatever it is, and the symptom develops, and he makes another interpretation, and eventually, um, uh, the individual can accept it. The point is that the closer the sort of content comes to the surface, um, there's a, a, a chance for new symptoms to develop, completely new symptoms that a person never had before. Um, so, Ferenczi says, I think quite rightly, that, gee, this is an interesting way of looking how people fall ill. Okay, so what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, it turns out that Alexander had found a group of patients whom he called neurotic characters. And these neurotic characters, um, don't have symptoms. They don't have symptoms. They don't have, I showed you the psychoanalytic DSM, uh, where there's no character. There are just symptoms. There's conversion, there's obsessional traits, and what have you. Um, but there are no symptoms. I'm, I'm sorry, no character. And um, so he goes on to say, they, they suffer from no very definite symptoms of illness, but they have, um, they live a life in the highest degree, impulsive. Now, this is not a great translation, impulsive. Because we think of all impulsive as meaning arbitrary or capricious or something like that. This is not, this is the opposite of arbitrary and capricious. People, in the context that Alexander is using the word tree hot, it means they're, they're actually suffering from what Freud called the repetition compulsion. They're always doing, they're driven to repeat over and over and over again the same mistakes. So whereas in the neuroses, i.e. the symptom neuroses, the unconscious makes use of special mechanisms such as conversions, etc., all characteristically isolated as far as possible from the rest of the person's life, the neurotic character interweaves his life with his neuroses. His life constitutes his neuroses. Okay, so there's nothing here about ego and id or any such thing. 
these people are driven by instincts to do certain things. And the um, patient he describes was an individual who's very successful in business, but who manages to find friends that separate him from his money. And by the end of, uh, by the time he presents for treatment, uh, he's lost all his money. He's a lonely man. And he had no symptoms. <laughs> and no money. And no money. Um, okay, so he goes on to say, um, these people can sit, continue their irrational behaviors literally at the most important and decisive moments of their lives. The behavior is equivalent to a neurotic symptom. The behavior is equivalent to a neurotic symptom. Um, now, um, oh, and the other important thing is it's, the, the people didn't realize they were ill because there were no, you know, it was not um, in the common, uh, you know, borderline personality disorder wasn't in the, in the press. People, the people who had uh, psychopathies, that's the closest contemporary uh, sort of analogous term to a character or personality disorder today, were, were very, very ill people. And uh, they were um, career criminals or sort of um, looked like they may be uh, mildly schizophrenic or so-called pre-schizophrenic. So uh, they didn't think of themselves as ill. They were just unlucky or some such thing. Okay. Um, so he asked the question, why don't these people have symptoms? Is it because there's not enough libido st um, stasis to cause a symptom to break out? Because you have to have a certain amount of uh, frustration for a symptom to, or is it because there's a uh, uh, insufficient depression? So I want to ask the group, what do you think it is? Is it with a show of hands? <laughs> libido stasis? Takers? One, two, three. Okay. How about insufficient repression? Well, how about, how about both? Either. Well, that's not on offer. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to pick one of you. Okay, well, I, by my count, libido stays is one. So we'll come back to that question. Okay, so you don't have to read this, I'll summarize it. The, the issue here is that. Uh, when uh, Alexander is talking about the tree puffed character, the driven character, he's consciously talking about uh, patients um, who suffer from the repetition compulsion that Freud discussed in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And Freud used the word tree puffed five times in that um, uh, paper. Uh, and I think it's quite clear, and if you see what, what, what Freud is writing here, um, he makes an interesting point. Uh, whoops. So when psychoanalysis reveals and transference phenomena can be observed in the lives of some normal people. Well, that straight cheese translates as normal people. But what Freud says is neurotische, neurotische persona, which means not normal people, it's just not people with obvious symptoms. And that's the key to, to Alexander's paper, is saying that you can not have symptoms, but you can be quite ill. Uh, Okay, so what does castration complex and character do? It widens the scope of psychoanalysis because it brings the pathological behavior of normal people into scrutiny. It demonstrates for the wonderful case report that character traits are susceptible to treatment. Uh, I didn't go into this, but uh, there's a short discussion about how um, the ego ideal uh, is, uh, plays a part in the formation of character. And finally, there's the wonderful quote, every neurotic 
character contains within it the germ of a particular form of neurosis. So this, um, uh, Reich was to later take this in and add that the converse was also true, that every neurosis has a, uh, a neurotic character at the basis of it. So that there's always a dynamic between the character and the symptom formation. Now, um, uh, Alexander's argument is strictly libido theory. There's, there's really not much about uh, structural theory. To begin with, it had to do with the fact that ego and I, uh, the ego and the id had not been published yet. This was in 1922. Okay, a few months after the Alexander paper appeared, Reich wrote two narcissistic titles. Um, now, this is also a wonderful paper. Uh, and he answers the question here, uh, that it really doesn't have to do with libido stasis or depression, it has to do with where is the libido deployed in the patient? Is it object libido? Is it narcissistic or ego libido? And um, you need to have object libido to have symptoms, according to the theory of the time. Um, and what Reich observed in this paper is that you will get the formation of symptoms under the pressure of the transference. The transference will overcome the, um, in favorable cases, the, um, the anxiety and fears of making an object connection. And then you get symptoms, like in the uh, forensic paper. What Ferenzi didn't talk about in that paper was the transference phenomenon. That wasn't the focus. Um, okay, so Wright goes on to say in this paper uh, that uh, what you have in every neurotic character is a very intense castration complex involving the entire personality. And this kit is always to be found. Uh, we find an astonishingly strong constellation, a narcissistic constellation, on which Alexander went to little stress. And this presents itself in the final analysis as a constitutional accentuation of the most important erogenous zone. Um, okay, now. So besides a focus on narcissism, uh, Reich says that because of this uh, intense narcissism, the treatment is going to be experienced as a castration in and of itself. And therefore, inevitably, there's going to be a strong negative transference. He doesn't talk much about the positive transference in this paper. It's a negative transference. And to protect itself, the individual constructs a narcissistic armor. This, as far as I know, is the first time in print where armor, Reich's sort of uh, hallmark idea, can be found. And then he goes on to talk about two types of armor, essentially armor, um, which we won't go into. But what I think is important here is that um, uh, Reich, I, first of all, focuses on narcissism, which is a, a very contemporary focus. Uh, as you know these days, um, and secondly, on the inevitability of negative transfers. And at the time, 1922, uh, the transfers was generally thought of as positive. When people talk about transfers, they generally talk about the positive transfers. And it was one of the outcomes of the seminar and technique that uh, there was a greater and greater appreciation of the negative transfers and uh, a way of dealing with it and even bringing it out. Okay. Okay, now a brief diversion. Uh, Harry, how much time do I have? Um, you have about half hour. Half hour? Okay. Um, 20, 21 minutes. Okay. So, about a year after that paper, um, this, which has not been appeared in English before, the dynamics of therapy, uh, I'll briefly go into this. And in, uh, in the seminar on technique, uh, which met every other week, uh, Wright presented a brief discussion as um, 
uh, as a stimulus to discussion in the seminar. And he's asking a question here. Um, he's contrasting hysteria with character neuroses. And he says that in a hysteria, in, particularly in a traumatic hysteria, all that's required for cure is remembering the repressed. Remembering the repressed is, is sufficient. In character neuroses, detailed memory work presently has no therapeutic effect. This is in 1923. Detailed memory work has no therapeutic effect. I find this a remarkable statement in 1923. Um, what Reich is saying is that you can have patients free associated on and on and on, it has no therapeutic effect. This brings up the question of the gaps in our knowledge of the processes of the working over of unconscious material. And he uses working over, verarbeitung, not durcharbeitung, working through, working over. In the character of life, a piece of the way he lives his life attaches to the animals. And with continual reference to the latter, an understanding of the infantile determinants of his company behavior can be reached. Yet it is precisely in character neurotics that there is a dissipation of affects. If, and it's a good word, for puffin, they go puff. And the affects go puff. <laughs> if without sufficient working over a drive impulse is prematurely made conscious. So it's possible to have premature interpretations. How would you know? How would you know if it's premature? Well, he's asking a question. Well, we don't know yet. But that is the technical question. When do you make the interpretation? The essential difference between the analysis of the hysteric and circumscribed symptoms and the character neurotic is this. And the latter, the analysis of the total neurosis crumbles into a detailed analysis of many resistances. And in the former, the breakthrough of the circumscribed, repressed variety position predominates. So this is a question about structure, about psychic structure. And when do you know when to interpret content? Uh, and of course you say, I don't know. I don't, that's, that's what we're going to talk about in this discussion group, he's, he's saying. But the idea, of the, the idea of a working over it seems to me is an allusion to the idea that in analysis there's a certain amount of ego strengthening that's going on in ego development. Um, okay. So, so then Wright goes on to discuss um, a case he had in this discussion, but after that this he presents his paper. And he presents a case of somebody who, on the first session of treatment, has a dream that's clearly an incest dream. And Reich tells the group, I waited a year, one year, before, and before making the interpretation. <laughs> so everybody was, Are you crazy? <laughs> and so Fader and Nunberg and Hitchman is saying, you interpret content when it comes up. And Freud later said, also said to him, right, of course, when there's an incest dream, you interpret it when it comes up. There was one person in his corner who agreed with him, a um, fellow by the name of Jung. So um, he got a lot of flat tricks. Um, but, you know, he stuck to his guns. All right, so this is uh, Freud writing to Reich. I'm going to now talk about the impossible character. That's all sort of preliminary. Uh, so this is Freud writing to Reich, uh, having uh, informed him that he's accepted the impulsive character for publication. I think the important part here is uh, the confirmation of the expectation I once expressed that the relationship between the ego and the superego 
will become an area of research of similar importance to that of the relationship between the person, ego and superego, and the object, which is, underlined, hitherto all that we have studied. Whether the expressions of impulsive character and isolated superego will prove to be useful in the end, I will decide. So here is Freud telling Reich, you have um, begun the study of, of structure, ego and superego, in relation to character. OK. Um, so in essence, um, the treatment path character, which is subtitled On the Pathology of the Ego, um, is a, Reich states the problem uh, that we in psychoanalysis have a very um, well-developed libido theory. We have no theory of the development, I'm sorry, id theory, libido theory. We don't have a theory about ego development. And this book uh, is meant to contribute to that, uh, to the development of the theory of ego development. Um, as he puts it, a, uh, a psychic embryology of ego development. So um, here's a nice summary that appears in the early part of the book. Um, which Dr. Weitzner already alluded to, but uh, every, and, and I think it really sums up uh, resistance very nicely. Two fundamental elements are regularly expressed in resistance. First, every resistance contains a repressed con content corresponding to a specific analytic situation. And at the same time, a repressing component. Second, apart from these specific elements or rather contents, Every resistance also expresses a specific form of resistance. So, furthermore, every resistance gets a specific character or stamp from the total personality. What does that mean, that the resistance gets a specific form? Well, it sounds like it could be mysterious, but I don't think it is. He's just simply saying that, that it's all about behavior, that you can have a uh, let's say a hysterical woman who has uh, symptoms related to repressed ancestral strivings, she's going to look different than an obsessional who has the very same, let's say, an obsessional woman uh, with the same strivings. And it's going to be reflected comprehensively and in detail in every aspect of their behavior, especially the resistance and the treatment. So, for those of you who have read character analysis, you can see that this is later reflected in character analysis. Okay, um, so I'm just briefly going to summarize here. Okay, so uh, Reich takes off from the central findings of the um, ego and the id explicitly that, um, that character traits are formed throughout life by, identif by identifying with the um, caregivers. And um, it, I, I should add that a piece of object libido becomes ego libido with that identification, at least at this stage of theorizing. Subsequently, uh, theor you know, theorists have uh, said that that's not always the case, but at this point, an object libido becomes ego libido with a um, identification. And it's those identifications that form character. But there's a key special uh, identification, which is the ego ideal or superego. 
in the ego and the id, uh, or I should say in, in the tree path character, uh, Wright refers to the superego and the ego idea sort of indifferently. And Freud does too in the ego and the id, but there's really, uh, I think, no way of knowing which, which uh, term was, uh, if there's a difference in the way the terms are used. Okay, so Wright is saying that um, uh, the key to understanding character or developing a, uh, uh, an embryology of character or a typology of character is looking at which behaviors of the parental personality the child incorporates into the ego ideal, either as positive or negative. The sexual identity or identification is important in boys and girls. The stage of libido development, so in other words, if there are pregenital or pre uh object ties that are being, that are incorporated, it's a different, uh, it, it's kind of consequential by comparison, let's say, of um, a phallic edipal uh, uh, identification in, in the formation of the superego. So in other words, um, there's just a, a, a very systematic attempt to um, uh, form a typology of character based on the superegos that are developed in, um, in an individual. And, and the, therefore, the challenges that are given to the, uh, the ego, the growing ego. Okay, and his, his patients were very ill, uh, as we talked about in the, in the book, Impulsive Character. First of all, they had all the symptoms that you could have. So he took issue with Alexander's idea that neurotic character would not have symptoms. They had um, severely traumatic and chaotic histories, including sexual abuse and in incest. Uh, they usually had um, an early sexual awakening, um, chaotic liminal, libidinal structures, um, no latency period, and then extremely exaggerated, as he says, grotesque enactments. So, for example, a woman who as a condition of orgasm during masturbation, had to masturbate with a knife handle to the point of bleeding. Or a woman who uh, got her greatest pleasure from uh, attacking her kids with burning matches and burning her belongings. And as he puts it, some of these people seem to be on the borderline. That's his term with um, schizophrenia. So then he asks the question, what is, um, what is the, the process which makes the defenses effective? In other words, these patients had repression. They could repress. So Alexander was, that question, um, they had, they had uh, amnesias and uh, symptom formation, so they could repress. But there was something wrong because they had uh, these uh, grotesque enactments and all the symptoms that, and all the, um, uh, the crazy things they were doing. But she says, uh, never gain access to motility in this compulsive to neurotic. So something's happening with the way uh, repression is deployed in these patients. Um, I think one important thing, two, two important points before we go to how uh, Reich answers the question of what's the defective uh, impression. Uh, the first is that Reich makes the point um, that the person on whom the ego ideal is formed is always the most frustrated parent. And this taps into some of the things that Dr. Reich was talking about. Um, that, that the identification is a kind of a solution to uh, the frustration, and that it's always going to occur in the context of ambivalence, quite severe ambivalence sometimes. And finally, this which I haven't read anywhere else, which is that the superego must undergo a reversal of the sex-denying superego 
with maternal or paternal exclusion for later health. In other words, uh, a child growing up is going to be uh, an incest prohibition. So how are how is a uh, an adolescent, let's say, uh, supposed to go from a, a, a sex negative superego uh, and then have a healthy love life with uh, a heterosexual object choice? Well, there has to be a reversal of the sex denying superego. Um, I haven't read that anywhere else, and a lot of his um, of Reich's uh, political work had to do with making the um, social conditions possible for this reversal to take place. Okay, you know, you want to do this? Okay, so um, unfortunately I can't talk in more detail about normal cerebral development, but Reich is asking about, you know, the question, how do these crazy patients um, uh, develop their symptoms and their character? So he said there are four possibilities for how superego develops. Partial gratification and stepwise frustration drives the need to gradual depression. So this is the healthy choice. Um, that First of all, um, from the beginning, there's a graded repression of, uh, let's say, a pregenital, uh, let's say, playing with feces or some such thing. But toilet training and things like that, there, it's not harsh, it's gradual. Um, and the person, the, the, the growing individual, accepts the prohibitions. At the same time, there has to be some gratification. So there's sort of a, a titrated or graded uh, frustration. So here's outcome number two. There's acute frustration of the drives in every phase of development, um, leading to a total inhibition of drives. So this you might see in a very uh, compulsion neurotic or as but it's just a unit patient. These are people who are completely inhibited individuals. Um, so they're essentially their drive expression is uh, shut down entirely. Complete lack of drive frustration from the very beginning due to a lack of supervision. So Reich says you don't see these patients. They're in jail or they're not in your office. They're, they're out there. And um, they, they are, well, because they don't have superego development, they don't have corresponding ego development, and so they're very primitive types, and they always get into trouble with the environment. And finally, there is the situation with the impulsive character. Uninhibited drive gratifications that will be traumatic and often be later prohibition. So, in that context, people, uh, individuals grow up and experience drives and express drives, and they can't repress. You can't repress after the drives have become conscious and acted on. Um, if, if there's an attempt then to repress under the influence of the superego, uh, there is, it's impossible, it doesn't happen, it doesn't work. So, what happens instead is that the superego develops not as an integrated structure, but, um, incorporated uh, as part of the, of the uh, ego, but a separate structure, totally. And so it then starts, so you know, this is an example. One of my impulsive patients was sexually molested by her father, but then was beaten senseless by him if she played in the street with her friends. So this would be a person who might um, uh, seek out uh, sexual enactments with a father figure, rather than repress the incestuous wishes and not act on them, maybe develop symptoms. Um, and instead of doing that, there's an enactment, and then there's a punishment 
of some sort that's, um, for example, uh, having to um, masturbate to the point of bleeding or uh, finding someone, uh, a, um, a sadist, to, to uh, beat her up or, in other words, ways, torture her. So what happens in the context of uninhibited drive gratification met with a traumatic prohibition is there's an enactment, um, there's an act, acting out on drives, and then there's a, um, the superego, which is not integrated into the ego, uh, attacks the person in a drive-like way. And so here's a situation where the ego is detached, I'm sorry, the superego is detached, there's enactment, and then punishment, because repression doesn't work. And these people are persistently going back and forth between enactment and self-punishment, enactment and self-punishment. And that was Reich's theory of um, what was going on with these patients. And then he went further and said that the isolated superego is probably a normal uh, sort of way station in normal development. Uh, we, we won't go into that. Um, now, if that sounds familiar, let's see, action, self-punishment, repression is not good, it doesn't work, does that remind you of anybody? It reminds me of Kermit. I think uh, that what, what, what Reich is, is doing here is, is essentially presenting the situation that Kermit later uh, referred to as the situation of splitting of different dyads in a context where repression is not effective. Okay, um, finally, um, uh, he was right, writing in 42. In the impulsive character, I moved from symptom analysis to character analysis. All analysis is character analysis. This was a logical move, but I did not have sufficient clinical and technical knowledge to follow through at the time. Thus, I stuck to Freud's theory of the ego and the superego. Now, um, I, I could show you, if we had time, how, how thoroughgoing the analytic, uh, the impulsive character is. But I think I'll just leave, leave it at that. Idealist philosophy. And 
in this article at the very beginning, Wright is trying to suggest that the key theses in psychoanalysis are in no way compatible with the dialectical materials position. And he takes libido and he reminds us that Freud himself thought that libido at some point could be put on something like a chemical basis or a physiological basis. And I remind you of that uh, 1895 paper where Freud envisions a psychological, physiological anchoring of such talk as drives my progress. So Wright was already doing this long before 34, at least on a theoretical level, and then comes the more practical application. Does that make sense to you? I couldn't follow it completely. What part? That's <laughs> well, part. As we discussed, <laughs> you're, a a lot, you're a philosopher. I was hoping you could explain it to me. <laughs> How it's possible to apply dialectical materialism to biology or psychology or both? I, I don't know. I, I, I know that I, I can't answer your question very well. I mean, I know that. Let, let's hold that for okay. for, for today's discussion because we go off on unless Dr. Kuban has something to add. Well, I was just to say that uh, I think both. Right? Um, Freud felt that there were sexual substances that underlay libido. He's very clear on that uh, in a number of places. And Wright was well aware of that also. But um, Freud was a, um, he believed in parallelism, psychophysical parallelism. And, and I think Wright did too in a different way early on. But it, it gets more complicated later, I think. I, I just want to say, that I'm reminded of a, a wonderful footnote of Freud's, I think it's somewhere in the New Introductory Lectures, where Freud criticizes dialectical Marxism, dialectical materialism, for overlooking the, the conservative factor in mental life, in other words, the superego. And I think Wright, in that case, would have agreed with him, but I, I haven't read dialectical materialism and psychoanalysis in a while, but I think Wright would have criticized materialism for leaving out a very, very important factor in, in, in sociology. It's a very complicated question. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Yeah, I, I thought in uh, Dr. Weitzner's, I, I enjoyed very much the whole comparison you set up. I thought that was very useful. And one of the things that it helped highlight for me is where I thought it, it opened the gateway to the, the clear distinction between dialectical materialism more than functionalism, which has been an important thing of discussion. Is there a difference? And if so, what is it? And uh, Wright's argument, of course, was that basically his argument was he was an organic functionist all along, but used dialectical materialism because it was the only term available, <laughs> but eventually found it insufficient. And one of your uh, schemas where you had the signal anxiety and the stasis anxiety, I thought that's a really good example because in the, the signal anxiety, you have a good antithesis, and the word antithesis is useful there. When you look at stasis anxiety, you see how you have to think energetically. By looking at the stasis, you're suddenly brought to a concentration of energy that can either be, can go outward in pleasure or inward in fear. So it brings you to a deeper point, which is what the ergonomic functionalism is all about. So they are different. The dialectic keeps you in a certain antithesis. Right. Ergonomic functionalism anyway, takes you forward. Parts of the talk, I yeah, OK. Um, unless there are any other questions. Just also, we have out at the counter, um, uh, in addition to food that people haven't eaten, that people are going to take home if you wish. Usually, uh, really, I guess it bad people devour the food, but uh, somehow, I guess, New York State might have impressed that impulse. Uh, uh, but uh, we also have a list for um, email addresses with contact information, which we appreciate if you put your names on that so we can keep you in touch with other events that we will take. We'll take it out. We'll be back roughly at 1 o'clock for the uh, finale. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Glenda and Dr. Weiss for the excellent uh, presentation. Having read the full presentation, uh, I realize how much they worked to, to cut it down. And uh, hopefully we can discuss the possibility of eventually bringing out the papers form, written form, or posted form. Um, Did you say that? Yeah, thank you.